Hello, this is Chris Pratt from Eurogamer, and last week I visited Valve to take a look at Artifact, an actual honest to goodness video game that they've been making finally. If you want to see it in action, we've uploaded another video alongside this one, I'll put a link here, but the long and short of it is, well, Artifact is a card game set in the Dota 2 universe in which you play free boards simultaneously, and it's quite a bit more Magic the Gathering than it is Hearthstone, which makes sense really given that this man is Artifact's lead designer, Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering. I spoke to him during my visit, as well as Jeep Barnett, a programmer with some serious experience at Valve. Last time I spoke to him was for an episode of Here's a Thing about how he and a bunch of friends got hired to make Portal. He also went on to work on games like Half-Life Episode 2, Left 4 Dead 1 and 2, Portal 2, and now, yes, he's on the Artifact team. So how about we ask these two some questions? There is plenty to talk about with Artifact. Starting with Richard, who I'd heard had been working on this game well before he pitched it to Valve. So exactly how long has it been kicking around inside his head? Well, my, my games tend to run into one another and separating uh, um, failed designs from stepping stones towards a game. Uh, a finished game is uh, hard to do, but uh, I first began thinking of electronic trading card games basically uh, as soon as Magic came out and we realized uh, how inadequate it was for uh, electronic play. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so since then, uh, I've been working uh, uh, I'm ever, constantly, off and on, on, uh, on different designs that would uh, try to bring what was so exciting about uh, uh, trading card games on, into the uh, electronic world. So yes, Richard is the lead developer on Artifact, but what does that exactly mean? How often does he work in the Valve office? Uh, Scaff and I as a team are pretty constantly, mostly uh, Scaff is here and I come in uh, at this point once a week, uh, something like that. Um, in general with games, my biggest input is at the beginning with the design, um, and, uh, and uh, so back in the day I was here much more. Did they give you a wheelie desk? I don't know if there were wheels. We, I was moved around a lot, I know that. <laughs> so what about Ice Frog, the mysterious lead designer on Dota 2? Is he involved with Artifact at all? So we've had him come in and play the game and he, he likes it a bunch. And uh, he uh, is pretty focused on other stuff right now, especially Dota. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he hasn't weighed in too much on the design. He's just been somebody who's enjoyed the game from the side. And what's the relationship with the Dota team in terms of building upon that game's universe? Yeah, so Steve, our, our writer, he's you know worked on Saints Row, the good ones, and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so he he's really awesome and has done a lot of writing both for Artifact and for Dota. And in a bunch of the recent updates that they've been shipping, uh, he's been kind of setting up some of the, the lore that's going to play out into this game. So setting up uh, some of the characters and some of the places that are going to be featured. Can you tell us anything new about Artifact's story? There's an overall story where the, the cards are created within the Dota universe, and it's kind of a mysterious reason why they've been created. But within the first set, um, what we're exploring is this big three-way battle between these factions. So there's the uh, Bronze Legion, uh, who are trying to defend their home city from the Red Mist who is invading. Uh, and the Bronze Legion has uh, set up an occupation inside of uh, this Vool city, which is kind of this forested city. And the Vools are cooperating with them at first, but then the leader of the Vools, Rix, um, sort of re rejects uh, the, the occupation and starts a rebellion. And so it's a struggle between those three factions. And uh, within further sets, we're going to continue to expand. Um, like the, the outcomes of what happens within this story will affect what happens in the next set and what happens in that set and how those characters change will affect the set after that. And what does that mean exactly? New versions of existing cards? So you, you see this in, in Magic and uh, in a bunch of other card games, but characters that you see in one set will have a new version in another set where either they've grown or they've you know, become a zombie or they've uh, you know, gained some new magical hat that does a thing or they, a sword that they used to have now that they're dead, somebody else has that sword, things like that. Can we expect any storytelling outside of the game itself, other than, well, in Dota 2, I imagine? Yeah, so, so um, the way we tell stories in every game that we do is a little bit different. Like, if you look at Portal or Left 4 Dead or anything else, like, we really um, try to tell the story in a way that uh, fits best with, with the gameplay and tell the story through the gameplay. And so with this, all the characters and units on the board uh, we treat as, you know, real characters uh, who talk to each other. So if you get, you know, Legion Commander and Axe uh, together on the same side, 
uh, they'll be like, you know, with our powers combined, we can take over this. And uh, but if you get them on opposite sides, then Legion Commander will be like, Axe, you betrayed us. And so it's really about um, uh, every time you play, you see a new combination of, of characters you hadn't seen before, and they expose sort of a new piece of the story and how they relate to each other. There's also thousands of lines of lore. Mm -hmm. Each card has their own lore, so uh, they're also audio recorded. Um, after you're done with the game, you can go to Axe and just like, hey, I want to hear the lore for Axe, and there will be like an except for that. And that with like spells, items, pretty much everything. Uh, so it's actually very low rich, the game. Alright, let's just ask the question, how does Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering, think Artifact compares to Hearthstone? Hearthstone uh, does an amazing job for uh, providing a game for a, a limited screen space and a, 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 a short amount of time. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we were designing artifact to do was provide a, a broader, more open-ended experience because when people go from magic to Hearthstone, they often, uh, while they often like Hearthstone a lot, they often uh, say that they wish that there was the variety that uh, magic offered. And so we tried to take all the bounds off the game that we could. So there's no hand size limit, there's, you can have uh, huge numbers of creatures into play in play um, and and uh, and the play state changes radically throughout it rather than uh, you know, uh, and, and it doesn't clear constantly like it uh, like it will in in hearthstone um, I think that uh, that uh, that when people play it, first hear about it that's going to be the natural comparison but once they play it they're going to see that it's uh, you know as different as poker and bridge right it's very very different games <laughs> They're, they're both games that have cards in them, but they're yeah. pretty different. Um, yeah, another thing that's very different is, uh, so, so in Magic, um, whenever you play a card, you have to wait to see if the other player is going to react. Um, this sort of has a version of that where we take turns back and forth. I play a card, you play a card. I play a card, you play a card. And so anything that I play, I know that you have a chance to react and do something um, about that. And so the order that I play the cards in is very, very important during my turn, and also uh, thinking about what cards you might play to disrupt what I'm doing is very, very important. And it, it makes quite a bit of difference between the, the two games. Hang on, there's no limit to how many cards you can have on the board or in your hand. Your computer's RAM is the limit, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the board basically, it turns into a little conveyor belt where you can drag and, and see all, all the, the hundreds of, of creeps that you've, you've generated into a lane sometimes. It depends on the type of combo deck you've built. Some decks really want to go wide and some are just like, I want to make one hero really, really beefy and just hit the tower once and that's it. So. Yeah, there's yeah. a fun story that we, we have a co-worker, Dave, that <laughs> likes to test the limits of things. He just likes to try and break things. And this was a, a couple of years ago when the game was like much earlier and still not on, uh, optimized. He manages to get a board with, I think, something like 20,000 creatures. Wow. Uh, but the game was going so slow at that point because it wasn't optimized. <laughs> he kind of left it overnight to see and then he came back the next day and the game finished and he won. Oh. So, okay, the game won. <laughs> it took like eight hours, but it did. How does the Artifact team feel about randomness, the dreaded RNG? I think that uh, randomness has a really important uh, place in games and is a uh, um, a unfairly maligned mechanic um, but it, it has to be used correctly and uh, um, uh, but uh, but when you when you put it into a game correctly uh, there's it, it increases the variety of situations you come up with uh, it'll uh, make it so that uh, th that you sort of have to constantly be on your feet um, I think it's very understandable why it's maligned because a lot of people uh, go into games because they want an environment they have control over, which doesn't often describe life so well, and so it uh, undermines one of the one of the things they really like in games. But if you go into games for uh, uh, strategic interest, uh, interest in strategy and, uh, and, and sort of interesting situations, uh, then then using that as a tool can really increase the, uh, you know, what, what you've got. Um, one of the things I really love about Artifact is that for anything that there, that is randomized, there's a way that you can build your deck to mitigate or control that randomness. 
And so just as an example where creeps randomly deploy to different lanes, there are heroes that allow you to control where those creeps deploy. Or when the direction that you're going to attack is randomly assigned, you have cards that can allow you to change which direction you're going to attack. And so it's sort of built into the play style of if you want to have a lot more control over the game, you can have that. But you're also forfeiting other cards that you can play instead of those. It's a really interesting trade-off to choose which of those types of strategies you want to focus on. Recently we've heard Gabe Newell talk about Valve's efforts to avoid artifacts becoming a pay-to-win game, but what does pay-to-win mean to this team? If you're selling packs to players, surely the richest of them are going to gain an unfair advantage. I mean, uh, uh, you can call golf pay to win because there's better racket, better clubs, better rackets than uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can get. But uh, and and they will affect your chances. Uh, but uh, but nobody would call it, really call it pay to win. Um, so what what we do with Magic is we uh, make sure that uh, that that the decks that are winning, we we understand what the cost of those decks are. And, uh, and we don't want those to be uh, prohibitively expensive. And, and, so, and so that means that we want a lot of common cards that are generally useful and, uh, and that the rare cards are uh, often finish it off and add some spice and a little, a little bit of extra oomph. But uh, by doing that, you can control what a cost of a deck is. But uh, if you have real trading in the game, uh, your investment can be moved around uh, from one deck to another pretty easily. And, uh, um, and yeah, so uh, we, uh, you have to avoid this thing where you just kick in money and you get a better and better chance to win and that's is what what the what the the way a, a well-designed game in this space works i think is more of a logarithmic curve you uh you you get enough cards that you can have some flexibility and and uh, after that you're up in the golf golf club range and and you know it's like and that can also be convenience because you don't want to do a trade do trades things like that all right, I'll do it. Hopefully you enjoyed this interview. If you've got any more questions about my visit to Valve and my hands-on with Artifact, do let me know in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. If not, as I said before, there's a video that's gone up alongside this one in which you can watch about nine minutes of off-screen Artifact gameplay. And yeah, Johnny and I get into some of the details from my experience with the game. So check that out if you like. And if not, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>